Back live speeds continual coverage of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Montoya on screen and he is in the pressure seat. He is trying to chase Ryan Dial in the Samax Pontiac. Meanwhile, Max Angelelli for SunTrust is closing in and Montoya has just been slammed by traffic. Dial has made very good heads up work of it and Montoya seems to be getting trapped each and every time and Angelelli has also had a bit of a rough time. I'll show you some vision earlier of just what these boys had to deal with. This is a lap ago of what Max Angelelli and one Pablo Montoya had to deal with. Check this out. Ooh, that was cool, oh, he's got jammed again. Yeah. yeah. Look at this. Nowhere to go now. He comes off that corner trying to go around the outside, but there's no way these guys fighting for position amongst the GT class. Now watch back. Look at Angelelli. Look at this. Three abreast down into the international horseshoe. And that was almost a wreck right there. You saw the right front tire of Angelelli hit the water and started locking up. Did a great job. Great job of saving that car. Big smear on Montoya's windshield there. He got hit by some flying rubber that Dial flicked up from the racing surface. Nothing too major, though. There's your race leader, Ryan Dial. See these cars twitching all about. Now remember the traction control has been taken away from the Daytona prototype cars, so they're really on the edge when you see that back end dancing. Well, how must they feel in the Samax camp? Two cars in the top five to start the 2007 season. Not a bad effort. Stretch into the bus stop. No one between Dial and Montoya now. There's first, there's your second. In the black car, the SunTrust 10, there's third place after this long in the race. Three hours to go, three hours, 20 minutes, and they're all right there. What a start this would be to the 2007 season for Scott Pruitt. Montoya and Duran helping him springboard his new racing season. Nobody led more laps last season than Scott Pruitt. 257 against Mike Rockefeller's 177. He was way and above everybody else in terms of laps led and then not to win the championship was crushing for Pruitt. This year, however, it's getting off to a much better start. We still have the distance left and then some of a normal race lead. There's a long way to go. Well, a normal Rolex series race is two hours, 45 minutes. Well, there's pressure Look everywhere. <laughs> Anyone ever tell that crow that rubber's not good to eat? <laughs> <laughs> Neither is <a> grill. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's pressure cooker situations for everybody, whether it be Samax, whether it be Chip Ganassi, or Wayne Taylor Racing. Let's get to the team principal now. Yeah, you're talking about pressure, Wayne Taylor. Yesterday we talked to you when you were having electrical problems. You were hanging your head thinking, here's our first run as a team, and we're already having problems early in this race. You guys are in this thing. Yeah, we are. You know, it's... Um, you can never count yourself out in a 24-hour, but when it goes wrong so early, it's really, really tough because, you know, when it goes wrong at the beginning, it can continue to go wrong. Or you can have a trouble-free run and then goes wrong at the end. But, you know, with these guys behind me, they just uh, methodically went through the program, uh, looked at what the problem was, fixed the car, and we've been running. We've had no clutch since the fourth hour, and that's why we uh, have to push each other at the start, at the uh, pit stops. But. Max and Jan, Jeff, everybody's an outstanding job. It's likely that, that Max will be the only driver running for the championship in this team. It's likely that Max will be the only driver running for the championship in this team. Is it the best thing to have him in the car at this point in time? Uh, no question about it. Um, you know, it's really, good, it's really difficult to get drivers at that caliber and to have two of them uh, and so many of the drivers of that caliber already doing things in other classes. A little bit like what's going to happen with Pruitt. You know, Pruitt now looks like he's good for the championship. So I think it's all pretty good. I think it's really good for Max. Max can't finish this thing out. Who's going to get back in the car? Wait and see. Well, will it be Wayne Taylor? Will it be Jeff Gordon? Or will it be Jan Magnuson? It's definitely a wait and see down here. Definitely some uh, movement up there. It looks like Angelelli got around uh, Montoya, but Montoya maybe back around Angelelli. Is that what happened, guys? Uh, staying there, Chris, with uh, Angelelli in second, and 
Montoya is third. He's just ran a little wide, but let's detail what went down. Check this out. On board with Juan Pablo Montoya. Tries to pass a GT course. He looks over here. He's going to go to the outside. Porsche moves him over. All of a sudden, he can't make it. Goes off this escape road. Good save there. Doesn't get in the grass, but loses. There goes. Max the axe. And that was the 72, Taffel Racing Porsche. And that was a very uncharacteristic move from Robin Liddell. He's an experienced sports car campaigner. He oh. may just have been a little unsighted, and it was a costly, costly situation for Juan Pablo Montoya. It was a great save by Juan, though, no doubt about it. If he had hit that grass, he would have gone right on into the guardrail. But he didn't do that. Race still on. Dial, Angelelli, Montoya. That's how they stand. Moreno still fourth, Fester fifth, Empringham sixth, and York Bergmeister still one lap behind and trying to reel in the gap between he and David Empringham. Oriol Servia is eighth, Michael McDowell ninth, and stationary zero two. Max Rojas Dixon is taking a half a second away on that lap. He's coming. And now he's put in a 44.9, a 1 minute 44.9, plays Ryan Dial's a 146.4. Stunning lap time from the SunTrust car, and Angelelli is dragging Montoya along with him. 1, 2, and 3. 44.9, quickest time we have seen thus far today. We're not surprised though, are we? Just can't help but to be impressed by the reliability, the pace. 559 laps down. And there's first, second, and third. Just incredible. Three different teams, all the same chassis. Two Pontiacs plays one Lexus. Who'll come out on top? Hey, wake up. Your car's going good. Speed's coverage of the Rolex 24 at Daytona is brought to you by Ruby Tuesday. Simple, fresh American dining from start to finish. And powered by Pontiac and the 260 horsepower Solstice GXP. The sun is shining not only on the world center of racing, but this young Scottish driver Ryan Dial and his Samax team. Out in front, he's flashing the lights. He wants to let the traffic up ahead know that he is being hunted. He is being chased by two of the best in the business, Max Angelelli and Juan Pablo Montoya. You ride with Montoya. He wants that second place back. How good is Ryan DL? He's out running these two. He ran a 45-6. He's excellent traffic. We've seen that. And now the pressure for Montoya. Time and again, Montoya has shown how he can rebound and respond from just slight little hiccups. Occasionally, he's run wide on the infield, searching for grip, and he's run wide and got into a very grip-less situation, but then he comes back every time and reduces the deficit to Angelelli. This intense battle, however, is letting Dial get away because both these guys are making several little mistakes, getting in too deep and losing ground. Dial is on the mission going right down the road. Don't want to forget about GT. It is still York Hart over Kelly Collins over Mark Bassing. So it's all very close in the GT race. Thrilling stuff there. Ralph Kellen is his fourth in class ahead of the Master RX-8 of Sylvain Tremblay. So good work there in the second GXP Pontiac. The 06 is fifth in class with Lake Reese behind the wheel. The GT scrap has been phenomenal, just like the overall and Daytona prototype class. I want to give a special shout out to someone who's doing it a little tough health-wise at the moment. Our statistician, Rick Radajak, his father, Lee, is, uh, well, he's had better days. So, Lee, if you're listening, if you're watching, all the best from us here in the Speed Booth, mate, and uh, we uh, wish you all the best. Dorsey with just over three hours to go. This can go anywhere. Angelelli's got some traffic. He deals with it efficiently. Forced high on the banking. And Montoya is in his draft. And they still, you know, they've come so far, but they're running the cars as hard as they can be run. And we still have more than a race distance, normal race distance, left to go. Anything can happen. How many times have you seen in the last two hours of a race something go so badly wrong? 
and they're running the cars very hard. How valuable is this time on track for Montoya in terms of speed weeks coming up, the Daytona 500 just three weeks away, time on the banking? Well, he talked about wanting to find out where the bumps are, and the reason he says that is it's very critical on the next Cup car to keep the front end of the car down on the racetrack. Of course, when you hit bumps, the front end comes up. When the front end comes up, you lose your frontal speed and your downforce. So he knows now where all these bumps are. You have to drive a funny line around here. The best at it, of course, was Dale Earnhardt Sr., who actually, when he drove the Corvette down here, turned top, top end speeds faster than his teammates because he knew how to dodge the bump. Now listen, you can actually hear it you hit bottoming. Listen. That's the actual chassis hitting on the bottom on the on the racetrack. First, second, third. Right there, through the bus stop. <laughs> Gotta be impressed with Ryan Dio, the young man holding back two X Formula One stars, two of the best there is, who both just turned identical 45.563 lap times to the thousandth of a second. Further back with the troubles for the 23 Ruby Tuesday Championship Racing Porsche. That will help Mark Goosens and Jim Matthews, Ryan hunter Ray, and of course Jimmy Johnson in the 91 Lowe's machine to perhaps leapfrog up into the top 10. They are still some 11 laps down, but it depends on how long the 02 and 23 are stranded. And for Mimo Rojas, that has greater implications than just not finishing this race. He is in this series for the entire year. He is Scott Pruitt's teammate, and that is exactly the reason why Chip Ganassi, Mike Hull, and the gang separated those two drivers, because you hedge your bets. If Pruitt and Rowe hasn't been in the same car, that takes all the championship points away for the rest of the year as far as having them in contention. By having Pruitt in one car, Rojas in the other, it spreads their chances, and Scott Pruitt stands a very good chance of getting a lot, if not maximum, points right here today. Now we have a wayward Porsche out there trying to find its way back home. In the meantime, young Ryan DL has been a master at traffic. Look at him here. Look at him, flashing the lights, working through this traffic. Now, it's not just luckily. He's timing these passes, and he's making them work to his benefit. Through the uh, bus stop, he could have tried to make a pass, but it's not wise. He didn't do it. He uses a launch out of there. Now watch it. One down. Up oh, and a spin here. This is Chris Fester. This is a top five car. He's got David Embringham, who's eating into him. He's got a five lap buffer, so it's not panic stations for Chris Fester. But this needs to be an error free run for the final three hours. There's the 74 Ranch Resort car, Wally and Paul Dallenbach, Catherine Legg, and of course, team and car runner George Robinson. Great to have them still running at this stage of the race. But Ryan got trapped here. He's going to be trapped behind the Pontiac as well. Catherine Legg is behind the wheel right now. They've endured their fair share of problems. They're down in 32nd overall. This is costing him time. Now, this time, it didn't work out for him. And look at the Daytona prototypes versus the GT Pontiac. It's the GXP. Ooh, there goes the Angelelli. <laughs> and wait, 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 because here comes Montoya. But here's the deal. Look what it costs Ryan DL. Max Ziax only has one car now between the two of them. And no longer, no longer. Here he is. Wow, look at the margin between the SunTrust car and the Ganassi Riley. Angelelli has been able to weave his way through the traffic more efficiently. And that's given him a huge bonus over one Pablo Montoya. That time DL got held up. We saw it happening as he came into the International Horseshoe. Two cars in front of him. No way to get around them cleanly. And that's all Max Yax needed. So look at this. It's on now at the front. So Ryan DL withstood the pressure from Montoya earlier. Now it's the same chassis car. It's a different power plant and a different driver. Angelelli is closing in. The difference in negating the traffic, two seconds a lap. Angelelli quicker getting through that traffic by a full two seconds in the out. 2005 it was for Max Angelelli, Wayne Taylor, and Emmanuel Collard. 
when they stood on the top step of the podium here at Daytona in Victory Lane to celebrate the 24-hour victory. Will they do it again? It wasn't an ideal start, but boy, they have been strong in the second half of this race. As Chris detailed earlier, coming back from a four-lap down deficit to be on the lead lap and to just be seconds away from Ryan Dial in the lead of this motor race. And this is when Maxi Axe is magic. He gets you in his sights and then he focuses in on the kill. He's got it doing it right now. What do you Look, think? There he is, he's coming. What do you think at home, folks? Will they put Magnuson back in the car? Will they put team principal Wayne Taylor in the car? Or will they put Jeff Gordon in the car? It'll be Mags, I guarantee you. <laughs> That's not the only decision. All three of these guys have the same decision to make. Whoever gets in those three cars at the end is going to determine who wins this race and who loses it. Well, I think Wayne wants to keep his eyes on the bigger picture. I think Jeff Gordon would relish the opportunity, but I think Jan Magnussen is the man for the job. Mike, what do you have? Yeah, down here in the 23 garage, now at the top of the show, we talked about it. The oh, If the 23 had any problems being at pit out, they had a long way to go. These guys had to go basically a half mile to the far side of the garage just to get to work on the car. They got here late, but they are frantically working. They had a lot of rear end suspension. At that last stop for the O2 car, they did not decide, they changed, they did not change tires. So Yerg was trying to run as hard as he could on what he had. They got back up to seventh place. I'm with Yerg. Yerg, what happened out there? Uh, during the, the stint without the new tires, I got more and more oversteer. Just got a slide in the bus stop, hit a, a wet spot there, and that was it. I'm really sorry for the team that that happened. Well, the team, Ruby Tuesday team, obviously pulling out all the stops this year. They hired the current reigning Daytona prototype champion. You know, there's still a long championship to go. They got to seventh, and, uh, you know, they're gonna. this car's going to be back out, and they're still hoping for maybe a top 15 finish. Even the best can make little errors. Jörg Bergmeister apologizing to the team for a, a slight mistake, caught a wet patch, and that's how easily it can happen. But it's so important for Team Ruby Tuesday to keep working as they will to get that car back out on track. Each and every point is important as Angelelli closes the gap on Ryan Dial. Take a look at this. It's on for the lead of this race with three hours to go. And traffic. Sam Axe versus Wayne Taylor Racing. Dial versus Angelelli. And there is one place Max loves to be, and that is with a clear track ahead, up front, on the top of the timing and scoring system. This is exactly what this man lives for. No more passionate guy than Max Angelelli. Five laps down in the middle of the night, had worked its way back, looking to take the lead. This is just round one of 14 in the Rolex Sports Car Series. Presented by Crown Royal Special Reserve. What a year we have for you. Off to Mexico City next, March 1 to 3. And a wonderful championship ahead. What a firecracker start to the year. The last win oh. for the SunTrust car as it catches some debris Sun on track. SunTrust hits debris. You saw it fly out from the back now. Did it get a tire? Did it hurt a tire? We have to be careful. These are all carbon fiber cars. This stuff is just like, like a razor blades laying out there on the track. Last time that SunTrust car saw victory was with Max Angelelli and Jan Magnussen at Laguna Seca last season. Wayne Taylor stepped back, he had a lot on his plate last year, and Jan Magnussen stepped in to do around about half the driving duties. He shared that with Wayne Taylor in 2006. So Magnussen and Angelelli have a wonderful working relationship. Will they again taste victory today? We'll know come 1.30 p.m. Eastern. You're right, D.L. You have to be a cool customer. Hit every mark, hit your brake marks, turn in. Don't get in with too much speed. Get on the throttle earlier than he does. Forget that he's back there. Except when you come out the corner, then look, see where he is. That 11 car comes off the corner really strong. Gets to the throttle and squirts. Let's bring you back a replay of earlier. Keep a close eye on the debris that Angelelli picks up. Off the back, under the wing, you're going to see it fly. There it goes right there. Boy, I don't know what that was. Certainly something underneath the car got up underneath there, shredded it up. Could have been a windshield tear-off. If he was lucky. Well, you think of the southeast 
associated with SunTrust Bank and Wayne Taylor. The team is actually based in Indianapolis, Indiana. There's Wayne Taylor, the team principal, and his men have done a mighty job over the off-season, and it really isn't much of an off-season, mind you. They worked incredibly hard to get this car just spot on for the start of the 2007 season. I'll tell you one thing they got right, and that is the launch off the corner. NASCAR terms, it's forward bite. It's got a lot of it, because when he gets on that throttle, that car squirts away from Angelelli. Angelelli makes it back under braking, but that's harder on the car than the way Ryan DL's doing it. It's hard, it's a hard, it's a difficult position for Ryan DL. I would say. Out in front with the pressure behind. And there's Montoya, top of your screen. The blue, red and white. Telmex Ganassi car. Chris? Lee, looking back at last year, DL and Angelelli never had a good relationship. It all started back at Long Beach when both of them got in way too deep in turn one. And from then on, it was practice, qualifying, or race. They were always into each other. And all season long, they were very verbal about their dislike for each other. So you know right now, they're not going to give each other an inch on the racetrack. These two drivers are going to give it everything they can. You're right, Chris. They really kind of hated each other by the middle of the last season, made no bones about it, and took every pot shot they could at one another. Will it carry over to this season? That's what I'm worried about. And the importance of this 24-hour race, is it worth it to mess up both cars? They're not about to do it right now, that's for sure. This is probably the most cautious I've ever seen Max Angelelli drive. He's playing it smart at the moment. He's just hounding Ryan Dial, pressuring him. Not too sure Juan Pablo hasn't backed off a little bit to get his tires back in check. He was sliding the car around off a lot there. Now I think he's back on song. He's not that far behind these two. Well, his last lap round was half a second faster yeah. than, than these two here. And look at Dial signaling. Here comes Angelelli on the inside. He thought about it. Then Dial closed the door. They need to get through this GT traffic efficiently without any hassle. And there are three cars up ahead for Ryan Dial to deal with first. That was a close call. That's called putting you on the money, is what that's called. Up onto the 74, Taffel Racing Porsche. Through by one of the TRG cars. Steady, boys. Slip up here and you're in trouble. An example of the multi-car teams. And Montoya has closed the gap. The pressure down in Wayne Taylor Racing would be unbearable for the team principal. Montoya had run too hard too early. His tires went off, he was sliding around. He knew it. He backed off. He let it cool down. Now guess what? The fastest car is now the third place car, Juan Pablo, coming toward the front. Last time round, Dial and, and Angelelli were in the 147s. JPM laid down a 145.6. Here he is. Let's ride with him. He is flying. One, two, and three. This Simple is as that. Great stuff. Unbelievable. Two hours, 50 minutes to go. And this is a separation after 23 hours. Chris, 22 what do you got? Hours. Well, Lee, we just started getting into that fuel window for the 10 car, so if we get a caution, Max Angelelli will be coming to pit lane for fuels and tires, and we have to remember here, guys, these guys can't get that car in gear because of the clutch, so they have to push it out of pit lane every single time. So it would be good right now. Angelelli take the lead and try and stretch it a little bit to build himself a bit of a cushion before he has to come in next time. Right now, Angelelli is growing impatient. Don't get out there too far, Max. That's where we've seen a couple fall off the road. It is on. That, Dial, Angelelli, and Juan Pablo Montoya. That is a good point Chris Neville makes, though, because that extra five seconds in the pits will lose them if they don't have that much in hand when they go in there. That pushing it out of the pit and popping it in the first gear is not as easy as it seems. That takes so long to make up five seconds on the racing surface, doesn't it, to lose that in the pits. We'll wait and see how that pans out. We wait and see who they will inject into the 10. We know that Patrick Carpentier, the French-Canadian, will take over the 11 and more than likely it will be Scott Pruitt who will take the 0-1 home. But who will drive the 10 to the checkered flag is the question. No driver can do more than three hours in a single stint. No one driver is allowed to do any more than 15 hours. And now it's the 10 car you see sliding at the back end, stepping out a little bit. 
engine or as Maxi Ax is trying very, very hard to get around that car and make that five second lead he needs. You saw the 59 on pit road. Roberto Moreno has done a great job in the Porsche powered Riley for Brumos Racing. Festa is in fifth position. Bert Frizzell in the AIM Autosport Lexus Riley is sixth. Oriel Serbia is seventh. And Michael McDowell is eighth. The 23 Ruby Tuesday Porsche. York Bergmeister ninth and Goosens, the car that Jimmy Johnson is in, is in the top ten. The Morgan car with Timo Bernard and BJ Zacharias, they're in 11th. And York Hart is in 11th. Let me take that back, is in 12th and that is the lead GT car. We may have a GT car in the top ten overall. Meanwhile, this is one, two and three for the outright lead and the Daytona prototype lead. Tell me you're not impressed with Ryan Dial. Unbelievable job he's doing. To handle the pressure of seasoned drivers like Angel Elliott, Montoya, stunning stuff. And this, without doubt, under full attack. No, no holds barred here. He wanted to put himself in the spotlight coming to North America in open wheelers. Well, he's really in the spotlight now, but it's in sports cars, in Daytona prototypes. And what a great launch pad for his year ahead in the Champ Car World Series. Peter Barron's team has done a fantastic job with that car. That car is still just on a rail. This has got to be fun for these boys. You know it is. Locked in a battle like this for the lead of the motor race and less than three hours to run. Maybe enjoy a lot more if they could breathe every once in a while. They, <laughs> they're not breathing much right now. And it's nice to see the racing surface in this wonderful venue bathed in sunshine after some pretty dreadful weather. Max got a good run off that corner. He really got out of there good. I'm impressed with that Samex car, though. I mean, it really squirts off the corner side. Identical cars here, both Pontiac Rileys. And Montoya in a Lexus powered oh, rally. Here we Look go. at Angelelli, he's setting it up. This began at the bus stop. He goes high through NASCAR 4. And the run down into one. We'll try to cut the it uh, Ryan's not going to give it to him. The Al's got him covered every lap. Watch now. That acceleration off the corner gives him that little added bonus that he needs. Takes the pressure off. See, he opens up two car lengths. Now Max will take it back away. but the pressure is on. Well, this is okay. That's a sister car. That is the second. That's Chris Fester in the seven. So he'll make an easy passage through for Ryan Dial. No doubt about that. He stays wide. Good driving, Chris Fester. In fact, he'll let all three through. As well Ooh. he should. Pinches Juan Pablo a little bit. A little tight there for Montoya. No harm done. And lets these three boys get on with the race at hand. Roberto Moreno, incidentally, has remained in the 59 Brumos Porsche and maintains his top four position. Good work. They're into a regular rhythm now. They're just feeling each other out in the top three. Scotland's Ryan Dial, Italy's Max Angelelli, and Colombia's Juan Pablo Montoya. Speaks live and continual coverage of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. And as you see, the battle is still very much on at the front. No changes while we're away, he didn't miss anything. It is still Ryan Dial leading Max Angelelli and Juan Pablo Montoya. And there's a fabulous story with the guy who is the team principal of this Samax team, the Sitco car, Peter Barron. It wasn't that long ago that he was in the driving seat. He's now with Mike Johnson. Oh, hey, all right, down here with Peter Barron. Peter, you got to be excited right now. This is amazing. It's just gut-wrenching. You know, it, uh, 
you know, I, I went to bat to get Ryan on the team. I absolutely love Ryan, and he is doing, I mean, he's been in front of Max and uh, Juan Pablo this whole stint. You know, he started with uh, those guys right behind him, and I don't think he could ask me anything better for the guy. Now, we saw at the beginning of the race a lot of the Pontiacs having trouble with their engines. You went yeah, a total different way. Your own engine builder went to Hasselgren Motor, and you have two cars in the top five. That's got to be great, too. Yeah, we work so closely with Paul Hasselgren. We're super happy about what he does and uh, really puts a lot of effort and time into it. And it's, it's just looking great right now. I can't say enough nice things about his motors. Now, talk, tell us the driver lineup for the end of the race for both cars. Well, Ryan's going to pit now any moment here, then he's going to do a double, he's feeling good. Then we have uh, Pat's going to hop in, and if he's feeling good, you never know how these guys are this late in the race. If he feels good, he's going to take it to the finish here. All right, well, the 10 cars kind of keeping their cards to themselves. Peter Barron says, here's, we, here's who we are, here's what we're doing. Come catch us if you can. And that's one of the rare times you'll see Peter Barron with a serious face. Pit lane. Leader. Lead car is in. He said that. He said that DL would be pitting any moment now, and he has. Now look at Montoya, though. Montoya's putting the screws into Angelelli. Down into one. He was right on him, heading through the tri-oval and trying to pounce for the lead. DL cruises down pit road. It's time for a uh, some more gas, some fresh tyres, and DL will put in one more stint before we see former, former open wheel star Patrick Carpentier. Angelelli's gone wide. Montoya's got the lead again. What a nice move that was. Angelelli, a little too much speed to cut down on that corner, goes out wide, opens the door, and Juan takes it. Let's check in on this stop for Ryan Dial. Yeah, the stop right now looks absolutely perfect, just waiting on the fuel. They don't want to drop the car until the fuel's done. That way there's no mistake about if it's time to go. The car drops are waiting. They're waiting, waiting for that fuel to go. You can hear Ryan Dial rubbing the mouth of fuel down, off he goes. Beautiful. That is a textbook stop. Nice work from Team Samax and Ryan Dial. Let's take another look, though, at that move. Montoya on Angelelli. Montoya, you ride with the new race leader. It was a low speed, low drama, but it was enough to get Montoya back into the top spot. Here we go. Come off the turn two area right like there, make it through the little S corner. Traffic up ahead. Might have slowed Angelelli, but he gets in here a little too hot. Goes out wide, look, the car pushes, he can't turn it. Walk in. Good catch though from Angelelli. Absolutely. Great catch, quick That's, hands. You talk about understeer, that was it. He could not make the front of the car turn. And we're building closer to stops for both the 01 and the 10. Speak of the 10, here we go, Angelelli's in. They're mirroring each other's strategy. And let's see how efficient and fast they are. Chris, let's see how costly this is. Well, everybody going through the motions here. Angelelli staying behind the wheel. This is going to be a perfect stop for this team. They've got to make sure they hit everything on the money. And as soon as that fuel is done, they can get this car back out on track. We're expecting them to have to push the car to get it started. Now, the 01 should be in a couple laps. Remember, Montoya came in probably five laps or so after the 10 and the 11. So he's got a little bit longer to go on fuel. Crew members already behind the car, just waiting for the last drops of fuel to go in the in the Sun Trust machine. Here we got three guys on the rear wing to push this thing as soon as the all the fuel is in the car. And these guys are pushing it. Angelelli hitting the starter. It fires up. Angelelli is away. Now, Lee, you were talking a few minutes ago about the sun coming out. It is starting to come out. The weather's still in question here. But as soon as that sun comes out, you can definitely feel the ambient temperature going up. I talked to the team manager at SunTrust, Simon Hodgson. And I said, you guys are all concerned about that coil overheating. If we start seeing some temperatures, if we start seeing some temperatures go up, you guys concerned about that coil? He said, we're pretty confident. The 11 sweeps around the outside and gets out. No worries. So Angelelli has the work to do. Dial is in great track position. Better pit stop by that much, just right there. And that could very well be the difference between going out under your own steam and having to rely on three guys pushing you out. It's just marginally uh, slower, but one or two or three seconds is the difference you see right there. And that doesn't guarantee it'll start when they push on it either. I mean, they got it going that time, but that's not the end of it. They were good, good stops from both Samax and Very Wayne good. Taylor Racing. What you need. So now the pressure swings back to Ganassi and Juan Pablo Montoya and his crew. And does Montoya step out now and Pruitt take it right through to the end, or will Montoya go one more stint? 
We will find out when we come back on the other side of this. Glad you could be with us on Speed's live coverage. You're watching Sports Cars on Speed. Pigs premieres February 21st at 9 p.m. Eastern right here on Speed. This February, it's pride, it's passion, it's adrenaline. Of course, it's Pink's. Speed's hit series is back and the excitement reaches its peak on the quarter mile track. The negotiation circle, you know the deal. Lose the race, lose your ride. Pink's season four premieres February 21. We have a new race leader and the race is on. So all fueled up, fresh tyres aboard, the Ganassi car, the Samax car and the SunTrust car. But uh, Montoya stayed out for a couple of laps extra. Now Dial is putting the pressure on. What a moment for young Ryan Dial, hassling oh. the heck out of Juan Pablo Montoya. Montoya throws the block, no doubt about it, moved up in front. Intentions known, I'm not going to let you by easily. Great stops from all three teams, but it was costly. Just that extra little time for the SunTrust 10 has put him back in third. Angelelli is playing catch-up now to Montoya and Dial. Great fuel economy out of the Lexus for the Telmex Ganassi car. So for these three drivers, it is their final stint of the Rolex 24. And our tip is that Montoya will hand over to Pruitt, Dial will hand over to Carpentier, and Angelelli will hand over to Magnussen. And they will have the hardest, hardest time because of the push starting. Oh, he chops down, got through good. That push start's going to cost them three seconds lead, no matter what they do on the pit stop. And then Max has to work extra hard, in which he is a 141, 145 1 against Dial's 145.9 last time around. So uh, Angelelli's turning some good laps, but the pressure is on. Updating you on GT, Dirk Werner in the Farnbacher Lowell's GT Porsche is still leading from Mark Bassang and then Andy Pilgrim in that Pontiac GXPR is running third. That's your update there. See Montoya get that toe down into the bus stop. He's thinking NASCAR. He went right in there up underneath the other car to get that extra mile per hour, of course, then. The Porsche that was in there to GT kill him. Now, Dial's going to get the pull. Look at this traffic. He needs to get by the Chiba car. And does so. Reasonably efficiently. Now, while we are away in the commercial break, it was exciting times. Pressure was on the Ganassi squad to service Montoya as fast as they could. They did a wonderful job. But the pressure was on the end of that and the pit exit. Watch this, Montoya on your right, Dial on the left. Dial coming around the corner right now. He's got the hot tires. Montoya on cold, but he's gonna to have to get him up to temperature quickly. And that's a challenge. How far can you go before you get too far push off the edge? And then he's handled the pressure very well, Montoya has. Dial has thoroughly enjoyed giving it to him. He's taking the fight and we will constantly monitor where Angelelli is as well. All three cars on the lead lap. I think that's Angelelli at the top of the screen in the SunTrust Pontiac Riley. So he's not too far away, but that playing catch-up business will be frustrating. Well, he made up a second and a half that lap. Max Angelelli at a 46 flat. Both the other boys at 47 fives. Doing it on the track as opposed to pit lane takes more out of the car. Tires, fuel, etc. And takes more out of the driver mentally and physically. But he's within touch. If he can get a clear passage through, this is what Max Angelelli is looking for. Updating you on other positions within the top 10 outright. Moreno is still fourth for Brumos Porsche. Chris Fester in the Pontiac Samax car is still fifth. Bert Frizzell for the AIM Autosport Lexus Riley sixth. Valiente seventh for Finlay. Then Gidley is in eighth for Doran. Then ninth is Mark Goosens for Lowe's, Riley Matthews, and Timo Bernard in the True Sport Porsche is in the top 10. Your Bergmeister has dropped to 11 in the Ruby Tuesday Porsche. And then it's Dirk Werner in that best Porsche GT3 Cup car for Farnbacher Lowell's is in 12th place outright. Great stuff. Well, let's talk more about the progress of this Pontiac GXPR. It's gone well, Mike Johnson, hasn't it? Yeah, late. You guys have been having a great run all night, all day, and uh, but you're just a little bit slower than that uh, those those Porsches over there. I mean, can you catch them, or is it just just a little bit off right now? Um, you know, we're ultra consistent. Uh, the Pratt Miller and Banner team are making fantastic stops. We're 
no, we're super consistent. We've got some good pit strategy. Yeah, we're a little slower than we want to be on the banking, but on the infield, Pontiac GXP is handling awesome. Well, now once, once we get a little deeper into the season, we get away from these kind of super speedways. You think your car's really going to start to shine once we get to the, sm the shorter tracks? Yeah, we've got a little more aerodynamic drag, and uh, we get to the tracks where our eight-cylinder torquey motor will uh, make up the difference. I think we'll be in good shape. But, uh, yeah, you know, when you first looked at the lap times and tested, boy, we, we were hanging our heads. But these guys, man, just keeping their chin up and banging away all night long. Well, we got a great battle up in DP, but we also have a fantastic battle down here in GT. And the thing to note, that uh, while we were watching that Daytona prototype battle, the 07 car actually had to come in for a stop and go on one of those restarts. So they've now dropped down to third in the 22 Allegra Motorsports cars and up into second. Big contingent of GM heavy hitters here, Doug Feehan, Steve Wasilowski, and a whole bunch more, and they will be thrilled with the progress of that new Pontiac to be that high up in GT. Of course, this is the worst track for the aero drag they're talking about. Most of the road racing tracks don't have this high bank, high speed, long straightaway situation. So they're probably at their worst right now, and that's not that bad. Now, right there on track in the 75, right in front of Max Antonello, JJ Lado enjoying his first race meeting in a Daytona prototype. His day has not gone exactly to plan. And Crone Racing will be somewhat frustrated because the race meeting has not gone to schedule. Actually, that's the 76 Nick Johnson that's in the uh, Crone car. They look exactly alike. You can't even really tell the, the lettering difference or the numbering difference. But it is Nick Johnson that's uh, holding up Max Angelelli. Nick getting set for another full season. Look at this, weaving your way through traffic or what. Montoya and Dial doing a slick job of that. Yeah, we look forward to seeing Nick Johnson and Tracy Crone again. The Crone Racing Pontiac Rileys, the Atlanta-based team. And then, of course, Young, Colin Brown, and Max Pappas doing the entire season as well. So we've got some fabulous cars, fabulous entries in this year's Rolex Sports Car Series. One and two. Going blow for blow. Angelelli. Whoa, there's a massive lose there in the bus stop. Was that engine or tyre? I'd say it was tyre. Was it a big lockup from that Pontiac? Or was it that Corvette? Or the Stevenson Corvette? It had to be tyre. That was a huge plume of smoke. That'll make you nervous when you're racing for the lead. And that tyre will be wounded. Oh, good run going here. Dial in the draft. He's got position. You get the run, no question. Moves to the high. At this time. Well, if anyone knows how to set up a move down into one off the trioval, it's one Pablo Montoya. Probably again up front. Oh, and that time it looks it's like not, engine smoke. Yeah, it's not tire. Well, you don't want to get that oil. is the 85. That is the 85. One of the best GT Porsches in the field. And it's the GT class leading car, Dirk Werner. Is he running into trouble? It certainly looks like it. That car for Farnbacher Lowell's has been bulletproof, perhaps up until now. That's two huge plumes of smoke, and I'm not sure what the problem is, but there is one. Well, we spoke with Carlos de Caseta earlier. It's a great lineup in that car. Drivers who have won the GT class here at the Rolex 25, uh, 24 before, but maybe it is going to go away from them. We'll find out when we come back on the other side of this break. Class battles, overall battles. It is on here at the World Center of Racing. Welcome back, everyone. The Rolex 24 continues. Lee Diffie and Dorsey Schrader with you here. Mike Johnson, Chris Neville on pit road. And boy, have we got a race. If you've just tuned in, this is stunning stuff. We've got three cars on the lead lap up front going blow for blow. One Pablo Montoya, Formula One superstar, is leading the way in his first Rolex 24. He's got young Scottish driver Ryan Dial, who now competes in the Champ Car World Series, chasing him down and former series champion and race winner Max the Axe Angelelli for Wayne Taylor Racing in the SunTrust Pontiac Riley sitting in third. And guess what? Guess who is suiting up for the 01? Scott Pruitt and Chris is there. 
Lee, I was just talking to Scott. He was ready to talk to us, but the team said, hey, we really need you to get your gear on. You got to get your helmet on. You can go back over and talk to Speed as soon as you're ready. But the thing is, is if we go to a caution, we're going to bring Juan in, and we've got to have you ready to get in that car. So Scott had to peel away from us. He's going to come back over and talk to us, but he looks very fresh. He got some rest, and he's ready to get in this fight. Well, this race has been a source of frustration for Scott Pruitt, who, of course, has won this before. But in this current configuration of Daytona prototypes, this race has eluded him. He has been a champion of the DP category with Max Pappas a couple of years ago, but he wants this big one in Chip Ganassi colours in the Daytona prototype, and he is less than a regular race distance away. Check out Ryan DL and how out of shape he got. Look at this, a little Watusi going on as he's trying to get that car. Yeehaw! Oh. Great car control. Ryan DL got in a little too hot. Got it crossed up, saved it. That's how hard they're trying. And that was a good call by Ganassi to get Scott, Scott Pruitt ready. If a caution comes out, and there very well could be a caution, we've seen a couple of cars out there smoking quite heavily. If one of those should blow up or something happen, it could happen just like that. Well, guess what? Speaking of smoking cars, the Grand American Road Racing officials are not pleased with the Farnbacher Lowell's GT Porsche of Dirk Werner. We highlighted that earlier for you, that it was smoking excessively. And I think they may be calling that car in. Mike, you can add. Well, I'm down here with the team, and they say they're going back and forth, and they're arguing their points, saying, look, you know, we don't see anything, we don't hear anything, the driver's not complaining, they don't even have the crew ready. That's, that's how much confidence they have that there's not a problem with their car. Now, of course, they see it on TV, but they're not going to come in unless Grand Am absolutely forces them to. Yeah, it's evident on our, on our monitors and on our pictures here at Speed, but uh, when it comes time, to plead innocence, that's what they will do, unless it gets to a point where it is uh, too serious. And the GT class leading car is under a question mark at the moment. The Allegra Motorsports Fiorano oh, there's Racing. More, there's another one going. The Corvette right through Stevenson's car smoking pretty heavily. Second place Porsche with Mark Bassing behind the wheel. Jean-Francois Dumoulin, one of the star drivers in that team. They're sitting second and ready to pounce if indeed the 85 Porsche does get called in. And Andy Pilgrim, former overall race winner here at the Rolex 24, and more recently a Speed GT champion, is sitting in third. And Angelelli just keeps chipping away at these guys. Last time around, he was a full second faster than Ryan Dial. So he continues to reel in these front two cars. There's your race leader. We know Pruitt is kitted up. He's ready to go. You saw that Corvette back there. It was really limping along, smoking heavily. I mean, anyone, anything like that could bring a caution out. That should just give up right there on the back straight. Mother Nature threw a curveball in overnight with excessive rain, and particularly this morning. High wind as well. It was really blowing this morning. But I'm pleased for the boys and the team. So we've got, well, typical Florida conditions now. Nice and sunny. There's Pruitt. He's good to go. Super fit. He's been a star of American racing, whether it be closed cockpit cars or open wheelers for decades. Triple Trans Am champion. He's a Rolex Series champion. Picked up Toyota's first pole in champ car racing. He was a champ car race winner. He went all the way to Nextel Cup. You couldn't have a more well-rounded driver to hand the car to, to take it to the checkered flag. And we know the fuel efficiency of this 0-1. It's good with the Lexus power plant in the back. Started racing at the age of eight. Go-karts. Dare I say, that's about 40 years ago. All right, let's hear from him. He's with Chris. Scott, you've run so many of these 24-hour events. Have you ever been in a position like this so late in the race? Not a 24, a 12, out of my family at home. We did a 12 hour to Sebring, and we ended up passing the leader the last lap, I mean the last turn of the last lap to take the win. So, this is what we talked about earlier. There's, there, these cars are good enough and strong enough, you can run them hard. I mean, as you can see, there's three cars that are running hard right now. And I'm, I'm anxious to get out there and get in the fight. The way this thing is going, are you ready for a last lap pass? Hey, I'm ready for anything. Whatever it takes to put that sucker in victory lane. Hey, whatever we, it takes, you know Pruitt's going to do it. Well, Victory Lane here at Daytona International Speedway, he's been there. Once overall here 
for the Rolex 24. Six individual class victories for Scott Pruitt. He knows what that's all about. Now, here is the Allegra Motorsports Fiorano Racing 22. It was in the tyre wall outside turn one early in the race. Right now, Mike Johnson, this car's vying for the lead in GT. Jean-Francois Dumoulin did some great driving through the middle of the night, through the darkness, through the rain, got this car back up into second place. Now, he's a previous winner of the race. He's with his team owner, manager, Fiorano. Now, you guys have won this race before, so how do you tell, keep your crew and your drivers, you know, patient when you now you see the 85 cars having some trouble? Uh, I mean, uh, we're just doing our best out there. We just need keep pushing hard, and Mark is doing a great job out there. He's been doing really good all night, and everybody at the team pit stops so are just buying on. The team from LA Group put a good job all night. We just hope the best for us. Obviously, we always want to win this race. We know the, the other Pontiac are good, too. We're just going to keep pushing hard, and hope everything stays together. Well, the Porsches have seemed to be the faster car in the GT class, but do you guys have the speed that the uh, 85 car has? I mean, are, are they going to put you, we're going to see you back in the car and watch you finish it out? I think we're pretty good, but Dirk, when the, Dirk, Dirk Werner's in a car, he's really quick. We don't know exactly what he's doing, but, uh, you know, we're, we're quick enough to be able to stay uh, in the game and uh, for second place and hopefully to get the win, but we'll see how that's going to turn out. All right, well, there's still plenty of racing to go, and that 85, the smoking's getting worse and worse, and they're still having a lot of communication with Grand Am, deciding if or not they're going to bring it in. Well, guys, it's starting to look like a boxing match, and in one corner we got Scott Pruitt, in another corner we got Jan Magnuson. Mags, you ready for this battle? I'm uh, ready. I think we have a really good chance. So exciting. These last couple of hours have been great. Now there's definitely concern. The car is not engaging the clutch coming out of pit lane. So when you guys do your driver change, the crew has to push the car. How much is that going to hurt you? It's a lo it's a longer pit stop, uh, so th that hurt us in the last stop. Uh, and generally got far, quite a bit back after the last stop. So I don't know how much, maybe five seconds at the pit stop, but you know, just got to push harder on the track. Well, we've seen Jan Magnussen definitely push hard on the track. He's had so many great drives in the Rolex series. How good is this going to be? Scott Pruitt up against Patrick Carpentier, up against Jan Magnussen. But there's some business to be dealt with right here because Angelelli wants second place. He's had to play catch up. It's been half a second, a full second, one and a half seconds. He's been eating out of Montoya and Dial. He has finally caught Ryan Dial. Can he execute the pass? What about that under brakes? That's what we talk about, Max the Axe. Man, he gets on that brake and knows how to do it. He's made up five seconds in the stint. You think he'll stop now? No. That's why we nicknamed him the Axe. He just chops down on the inside and under braking. He is savage. And he has given it his all. I've never seen anybody outbreak Max Angelelli. He is the master with the brake pedal. High on the banking. Down the super stretch toward the bus stop. There's been some pressure released from Montoya. There he is, just on the left of screen, into the bus stop already. And Angelelli continues to turn the screws on Ryan Dial. We are working closer towards the next round of stops. And we're working our way towards the checkered flag. Welcome back to the Rolex 24 at Daytona. We've talked to the two other drivers who are going to be in this fight. The third and final guy, Patrick Piantier. Patrick, you're going to go up against a couple guys who have won this race before. This is only your second time here running it. Are you ready? Yeah, for sure. You know, we're ready to fight, man. We're going to go and uh, try to fight it to the end. We had a great uh, 22 hours so far, so there's only two left, and uh, we're going to go there and give these guys a fight for sure. What does the car have left in it? Is Ryan just taking care of it, or is he giving it everything he has? Now, you know what? The whole race, we've been giving everything we have. You know, we've been taking care of it, but uh, this race like a sprint, a sprint race. I don't know what it was before, but nowadays, you know, you got to be wide open all the time. You got to... Be careful with the gearbox, but you got to run hard all the time. There's so many talented guys out there. Well, good luck, man. I talked to Peter Barron right before Patrick, and he said the car is in great shape. The only problem we've had is contact with the 01 during the night. Well, speaking of contact, there was almost contact between the SunTrust Pontiac Riley and the Robinson Racing Machine. Catherine Legg is behind the wheel. Check this out. That's Ryan Dial. There's Catherine Legg. Angelelli on the inside. Oh. There was contact. And Angelelli a little bit, little bit optimistic. Got into the side there of Catherine. Just wanted to get by so badly. There wasn't enough room there. There just wasn't enough. 
It well, cost him some time. So long as there's no damage on that front right, I don't think there'll be that front left, I should say, rather. No, which right. is not obvious. And it was just a slight nudge, but it was enough to turn leg around. And Angelelli lost time on Dial. Doesn't take much, and luckily, though, damage has been done. He can continue his charge, but now he's lost three or four seconds at least. Makes it all the harder when they make that pit stop. Inside the cockpit of the 01, Juan Pablo Montoya, focused like you've never seen. And what a massive turnaround for this guy from the lofty heights of Formula One, where he is just pressured all the time from not only the team, but the press and the fans to come here. And he's been very relaxed this weekend. He's been wandering around. He's got a bunch of mates here and he's been having a very good time. But then he gets thrust right back into the major spotlight when Speed Weeks begins. And he is under examination as a NASCAR Nextel Cup rookie. He will have quite the experience when he runs this Daytona 500 as soon as he gets in. It'll be something that he's never done before, just like this race. I think it got to a stage, too, where he's one of those guys that simply loves to race, and he wasn't enjoying his racing anymore at Formula One level. I mean, such a transition he's going to make when he comes into this first Daytona 500 and gets to experience what it's like to be out there with those... <laughs> 43 guys and those big cars pushing all over the place. And all the things that go with this great American race, I mean, the amount of people that are here this weekend, this is the biggest 24-hour fans I've ever seen. Uh, and I've been coming here over 30 years, but it's dwarfed by what happens during the Daytona 500 weekend. I think he will be truly, truly in awe when that uh, spectacle comes here in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, these last pit stops, Lee, are going to be the make it or break it. And unfortunately for the 10, they've got the hardest job to do. If you're a NASCAR Nextel Cup fan and you're tuning in to see one of your favorite drivers, it's certainly looking good for Jeff Gordon. His team car is currently placed in third. For Jimmy Johnson, well, the 91 experienced some problems with Mark Goosens at the wheel. That car is currently classified in 12th position for tony stewart the 20 car has retired it is parked at the moment and for he butch Lightsinger, and andy wallace max crawford and the gang it's been a very frustrating 2007 rolex 24. Well, you can say that again they they normally are in pretty cheerful spirits but i have not seen any smiles in that camp uh, throughout this entire week more promising news though for 2000 nascar nextel cup champion bobby labonte he is sharing the ride in the Finlay car with Michael Valiente, who is placed seventh at the moment. What about former F1 driver, former champ car star Roberto Moreno? He's fourth in the 59 Brumos Porsche, the Riley chassis car. And this team will be delighted. JC France, Hurley Hayward, Roberto Moreno. They've done a nice job in this car throughout the weekend. And Joao Barbosa, the Portuguese driver, I'll be thrilled to be in the top five. I'll be disappointed if they can't break onto the podium, but we've still got two hours, five minutes left. The seven, Roger Yasukawa, who we know from the IndyCar series, Thomas Enger, who has just been unbelievable in all kinds of weather and all kinds of condition. This car started 28th on the grid, and Enger just grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and took it up into the top 10 and has not looked back. And Chris Fester has done a wonderful job as well. This car is an interesting one. The AIM Autosport, Lexus Riley. Bert Frizzell sharing the ride with his brother Brian, young Mark Wilkins from Canada, and David Empringham, who won the first ever Daytona prototype race here back in 2003 with Scott Maxwell and David Brabham. They won that race in a Ford Multimatic, and they run in the sixth position at the moment. forward to seeing them race throughout the entire Rolex sports car series. That car actually, it's got one of the more unique sponsorship deals. It's actually sponsored by Exchange Traded Gold and Barrick Gold Corporation. And it's quite a story where the Exchange Traded Gold 
backed by allocated gold held in a vault, offer investors an innovative, cost-effective and secure way to invest in gold that's easier for e individual investors rather than the gold commodity market. Got a lot of gold in your vault, don't you? I wish. <laughs> Me too. One of the regular competitors at the Rolex 24 is, of course, Team Seattle. We have a soft spot for those guys for the wonderful work they do for charity. And one of the main players in that organization is Don Kitsch Jr. He's with Chris. It's been 11 years now that Team Seattle has been coming to the Rolex race to raise money for the Seattle Children's Hospital. Don, just about every year we talk to you about the good work that you do, but please reset the story again. Tell all our new viewers this year what exactly Team Seattle does. Well, you know, before we talk about what we do, we need to thank some people, first of all, of our teammates. Grand American Road Racing, Daytona Speedway, our wonderful support from the Speed Channel. All of our corporate and private individuals who support us out of Seattle and our wonderful Team Sienna Synergy Group that run our cars for us. Pledges per lap completed. Nickels, dimes, quarters, dollars all out of the Seattle area. Yeah, every lap completed, $460,600 brought in so far. We're lapping at $658 a lap, 700 laps completed. That puts us at $460,600. And you know, it's all good news for us. Our 82 cars had a long, hard 24 hours. It got stuffed hard and destroyed at about 3 a.m. this morning. Uh, but our 83 cars out there circulating, making laps, we're going to leave your happy campers with $460,000, $465,000. And every dime of that goes to our children's hospital. We couldn't have done it without speed. You guys have been so, so supportive for us. And quite frankly, for all the other people in this nation, this research that we're doing at our Seattle Children's Hospital is syndicated across the nation to all children's hospitals. So we're helping all the kids, and we couldn't have done it without Speed, Grand Am, Daytona, and our wonderful partners at Synergy Racing, all of our supporters in Seattle. Thank you so much. John, over the years, how much money have you brought in? 2.2 million bucks so far. 2.2, well, well, almost 2.3 now. And you know what? We've won this race twice, so. You know, we got nothing to complain about. It's all good. And isn't that the truth? We always talk about how important it is to win this race, to walk out of Daytona with that Rolex Watts. But what these guys walk out of here every year, I think, is so much more important. As we were hearing from Chris and Don there, you may have noticed that uh, Steve Johnson got a helping hand in the bus stop. He's added another driver to his list of, uh, <laughs> to go and just have a, a gentle discussion with at the end of this race. They're picking on the wrong guy. Time to squeeze in another quick break. We'll be back with more from the Rolex 24 as this race builds towards a gripping conclusion. Hey guys, look at that. Montoya just put in. Reminding you, the Jewel 150s are live on speed. February 15, 2 p.m. Eastern. It's the most exhilarating qualifying event in NASCAR, and it's right here on speed. The Jewel 150s, where the drivers have one last shot to race their way into the Daytona 500. That's February 15, live right here on speed. Sun shining, weather's great, race is unbelievable. Montoya, Dial, Angelelli, one, two, and three, all on the lead lap. Roberto Moreno, two laps further back. Take that back four laps further back. So it's a fair fight, level playing field, one, two, and three. And we've got a similar scenario in the GT class. But let's highlight some of the more well known drivers from the NASCAR Nextel Cup. Two in, two out. Tony Stewart is gone. That car is retired. And the 91 Lowe's car for Jimmy Johnson not long ago blew up. Jeff Gordon stands a very good chance at winning this race, if not standing on the podium. And Bobby Labonte still very much in play in the top 10. So mixed fortunes. Two still in great positions, and two guys who have stood on the podium are gone. For our open wheel guys, both Champ Car and IRL, well, it's done for Jimmy Vassar. The car's still circulating, but uh, well down the order. They lost an hour right at the beginning of the race due to a collision. Montoya, we know who's leading, and it's been a frustrating day for Paul Tracy and the Mike Shank Racing Organization. 
plenty of IRL IndyCar stars. A 58, Scott Sharp, boy. Those guys will be just devastated because they should have and could have won this race, if not been on the podium. And for Dixon, the 02 Ganassi car, it all slipped away when Mimo Rojas slid off the track. He and Dan Weldon in the same boat. And Sam Hornish Jr., the six is still running. They're in 23rd. And uh, rather, this is the uh, 60 car, I should say. Running in 14th position, Mark Patterson behind the wheel. Chris, what do you have? Lee, I'm down here at Mission Control for Brumos with Bob Snodgrass, definitely the captain of the Rolex Series. Bob, right now, Roberto Moreno, fourth place, couple laps back, but we're still looking for a podium finish for the Brumos car. Well, we sure are. You know, last year we were running third, and with 15 minutes to go, we were knocked off the track. We ended up fourth. Actually, it'd be we'd be really happy with a third place here. A podium would be great. It's been a long time since we've been in there, and I frankly would like to taste the champagne. Bob, you've won this race six times as a sponsor, three times as a car owner. You've been to so many of these. Have you ever seen a finish like we're having here these last couple hours, these top three cars? You can really throw a blanket over them on the racetrack. No, this is a true testimony to the fact that we're in a series that is a really competition, not exhibition. Well. This team was definitely one of the first teams to commit to this new formula of Daytona prototypes. They've been here all along, and they want to get back in this game. They're doing it with this Riley chassis. All right, the 47 car just came in for a quick fuel, tires, and driver change. Their exhaust system is actually, the whole left side exhaust system fell off, and the right side has basically unpeeled itself. Now, these guys have had a lot of problems with over uh, oil leaking out the back at the start of the race, and they've worked through their problems to get back up in the top 10. But a lot of these cars now, they're just getting worn out. They don't want to restart. So you can see the guys pushing at the car all the way down pit lane. There it fires up, and uh, off they go. The Porsche powered Riley, Timo Bernard is one of the star drivers in that lineup with the Morgans and BJ Zacharias. They're in the uh, top 10 in ninth position at the moment and pushing as hard as they can to try and hang in there. We're less than two hours from the finish of this great race. How about those mechanics after 22 hours pushing that 2300 pound car all the way down the pit lane to get it running again. Believe me, those boys are tired. Well, the Rolex Sports Car Series presented by Crown Royal Special Reserve continues to grow in health and wealth to a certain extent because the series is proud to boast more than $2.5 million posted in contingency sponsorships and awards for the 2007 season for both the Daytona prototype class and the GT class. So there's a lot to play for in 2007. Chris. Well, the 59 Brumos machine is in. Roberto Moreno getting out from behind the wheel. Did a great stint this morning. Joao Barbosa getting in the car. It looks like he's going to finish out here. Yeah, but Joao won this race just a couple years ago in GT1. The team saying that the car's in good shape. We're just down a couple laps, and we're hoping to try and make something back here. They're thinking that there could definitely be a good battle on our hands between the top three cars. So maybe someone's going to get pushed off the racetrack. That might help us out, get us on the podium. But right now, Joao Barbosa looking to get in this battle. Joao knows what it's like to grab one of those fabulous Rolex wristwatches. He and Andy Wallace shared the duties in that Mosler. The second Samax car is in and the countdown continues on the official Rolex timing clock. We're looking towards the check-in. Since the inception of the Daytona prototype formula, there has never been a repeat winner in the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Are we about to have a new combination again? It may very well be the same team in Chip Ganassi racing with Felix Sabatis, but a whole new driver lineup. The man of the moment is Montoya. Juan Pablo has done an outstanding job in his first appearance in a Daytona prototype. He won the Indy 500 on debut. Can he do the same at the Rolex 24? Look how relaxed he is in there. He's focused on the job at hand. Time running out. They're not catching him. 
Class leading car in GT for Farn Barker Lowell's Dirk Werner, who is a young standout well, look, talent, but there they've been it is. In too. They were made to come in by Grand Am because of that smoking that you saw quite a long time back, and you can see something under the hood. Well, this plays right into the hands for the 22 Allegra Motorsports Fiorano Racing Porsche. Mark Bassang is still behind the wheel and now closing the gap. That doesn't look good. That doesn't look like the type of smoke when you've got oil on a hot exhaust system or something. It looks like nasty stuff. It's Kevin Rausch in the 27 Porsche, a little further down the order in the GT class, but the pressure is on the Farnbarker Lowell's organisation. And this is the car who could take the lead, that could take the lead in the class. Marc Bassing, Jean-Francois Dumoulin. And the rest of the boys from Allegra Fiorano. Exciting times as the 22 takes to the banking. And it's pit time. Carlos Di Caseta. And Scooter Gable will be very excited. The 85 is released. So they're now on the same lap and they're within touch once they complete this pit stop. So it's on in GT just like it is for the overall honours in the Daytona prototype class. Yeah, but what was wrong with the 85 and did they fix it or did they just wash it off? And one and three quarter hours remaining. They are not out of jail yet by a long shot. We're expecting the 11 in for Samax, the Sitco Pontiac Riley. And Ryan Dial should feel very proud. He has done a sterling job in that car. We're expecting the 11 in any lap now. We expect this car, the 01, to keep on trucking for several more laps. They're getting excellent fuel mileage in that Lexus Riley with Montoya behind the wheel. Just on the outside of the AM Autosport Doncaster Racing Porsche. Dave Lacey behind the wheel, a veteran of Grand Am Rolex Series Racing came up out of the what's now the Coney Challenge Series. The Doncaster team have been a force to contend with in Porsches for many, many years. Here's Dial. We'll keep a watchful eye. There's Patrick Carpentier. Hey, Mike, you're still standing by? Yeah, Leon, down here waiting. I, 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 saw you, I saw you chatting with Patrick earlier during the commercial break. How is he? Is he relaxed, looking forward to it? Oh, no, he's pumped up. He's ready to go. He says this is what he's been waiting for, you know, his entire career. And it's opportunities like this that just don't come up very often. So when they do, you know, you just want to get in there and do drive as hard as you possibly can. So he's definitely excited. And this team is very excited, too. You know, they're just all anxious. They're just, like, ready to just pounce over this wall as soon as this car comes in. I think some of them might even fall off the wall before the car gets here. He missed the championship when he was a champ car driver, but he most certainly was a race winner. And in 2002 was one of his best years. Still really took the fight to Cristiano De Matta. And now the 11 is in. The young Scotsman, his job is done for this weekend. The pressure now falls on the shoulders of the French-Canadian Patrick Carpentier who made his name for Players Forsyth Racing in the Champ Car World Series, a former Atlantic driver as well. And now it's time for Patrick to climb aboard. Well, as you can see, he did a, Ryan did a perfect job hitting his marks and get, crews getting to the tires. And what they do, they got a guy helping on the driver change to make sure that driver changes as quick as possible. The front tire guy goes around the front. Now he's going to change the, the other front tire. They're adding a little bit of oil to the top of the car, you can see. And now the whole idea is just waiting for the fuel. We're going to see this car at least one more time before the end of the race because they can do about an hour on a tank of fuel. Fuel boat down. And off we go. Just an absolutely perfect stop by the 11 team. And he actually is going to fly down the pit lane. Just got to watch out. Pit speed, 45 miles an hour. Good job, Patrick Car Carpentier. Made absolutely sure he was not going to stall the Sitco Pontiac Riley. Now he can settle in. And the next thing he wants to see is a clear track ahead and the checkered flag. One hour, 43 minutes away. And what a double stint Ryan Dial put in. I mean, that really speaks well for him, doesn't it? Fantastic does. job. So now we wait and watch for when Montoya will pit and when Angelelli will pit. Mike? 
Yeah, I was just going to add, I'm going to talk to the team real quick. The fuel on that stop seemed to go a whole lot faster than it did on the last time we were there. So I'm just trying to get a, a quick, the team looks a little concerned. I'm just going to ask them real quick, and I'll get back. Hey, Jeff, Jeff Carter, that stop seemed to go a lot quicker than the last one. Did you guys get a full load of fuel in there? Yeah, we just did uh, fuel to tires, basically. What we did is we waited till the uh, driver change was done and the tires, and then we're done. So. All right, well, the crew's definitely very confident they got a full load of fuel. We'll see them one more time before the end of the race. And I'm sure Ryan Dial is taking a much earned rest and drink as things settle down somewhat. And we wait for the 01 and the 10. When will they pit? And does the SunTrust Pontiac Riley get away cleanly? Those problems they've been experiencing. Joao Barbosa maintains fourth. Roger Yasakawa for Samax in the top five. Question marks over one. Pablo Montoya coming into the Rolex 24 at Daytona. How would he perform? Well, look at this. It's what it looks like when you're a race leader. He is coming towards the end of his final stint in the great race because he hands over to team regular driver Scott Pruitt who knows what it's like to win. He did it back in 94 but would dearly love a victory in a Daytona prototype here at the World Center of Racing. Salvador Duran has done his end of the deal. He's finished and while we're away the SunTrust Pontiac Riley for Wayne Taylor Racing has pitted. The driver exchange has occurred and here it is. Angelelli out, Magnuson in. And all things went perfectly, like it should be. No mistakes made, but watch at the end of this. Once they drop the car off the jack and they pull the plug, watch how long it takes them to push start this car. Remember, it doesn't have a clutch. Here we go. They start to push it right now, but it doesn't fire until right about there. How much time? Five seconds. And the Samax car, the 11, with Patrick Carpentier had already gone flying by at that stage. Chris has been costly. Dorsey also on that stop. They did take a full tank of fuel on the SunTrust machine. Now, that might give them the opportunity. The next stop, they shouldn't need a full tank. So by taking a full tank now, they can take less later. So that might help them out with the push start. Now, the 0-1 getting ready to come into pit lane, they can also use that strategy. Will they do a shorter stop now or a shorter stop later? All the guys up on the wall down here at the Telmex pits, Scott Pruitt on the wall waiting to get in his chance behind the wheel. We're standing by. Now, the Samax car, the number 11 with Patrick Carpentier in it, they short-fueled. They put as much fuel in as the time it took to put the tires on. So they're going to have to come in for a longer stop for that last one. Well, back in the 90s, Max Pappas carved his name in American racing just with a brilliant drive in this race could it be the same situation for ryan dial he's with mike johnson well uh, back, back in 2005 peter baron hired you to drive one of his BT, v, uh, gt porsches you went to a pacific coast last year yeah, i asked uh, peter earlier today i said you know you got ryan dial back he said you know i had one choice that was my first choice he definitely proved he made the right decision today yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I got to thank Sicko and, uh, and Sam X Racing for kind of having me back. But yeah, Peter and I go back a few years, but the car's been running really good today. And uh, it's just uh, it's phenomenal just to be battling out with guys like Montoya and Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, I want to say a big thanks to Pacific Coast for kind of letting me do this. And uh, another Washington cheer me on just a moment. All right, talk about the pressure of having a guy like Juan Montoya right there. Is, that, is, it, is it crucial or you don't you just kind of block it out? Well, he's kind of a hero of mine, so it's... You know, far of it, you're, you're kind of want to prove a little point to him, but no, it's mega. It's real fun. All right, well, great job. we got to go over to Chris real quick. Juan Pablo bringing the 0-1 machine to pit lane. Scott Pruitt getting his last chance at this fight. He wants this race so bad. This team doing a great stop here. They're just cleaning out the radiator, making sure everything is done. Pruitt already in, tires on, just waiting for the last ounces of fuel to get in the car. So they are taking a full stop here. Well, we know how passionate Scotty is about his family, his wife Judy and his kids. The other thing he's passionate about is being inside the cockpit of this Daytona prototype. He is at home now. He's at one with this car. He came in in the second season of Daytona prototypes back in 2004 and has been at the front of this field ever since. Can he take it all the way to a checkered flag victory in the Rolex 24 at Daytona? It all begins and ends now 
Vaprua. Well, the Ganassi crew took on a full fuel load, so when they do stop this last time, they can short fuel. The 11 car took on a short fuel load. Their time is going to be longer. And, of course, the 10 car took a full fuel load, but they have to push start their car. That's going to all play out to who wins this race when they come into that last pit stop. Updating you on some other positions. Yasakawa is five, Wilkins six, Gidley seven, Valiente eight. And the top GT car is now in the top ten. Dirk Werner, the 85 was released, even though we saw heavy smoking as Pruitt weaves his way through traffic and almost touches one of the Pontiac GXPRs. That was a close call on his outlap. Fortunately, the Pontiac saw Pruitt and was able to take evasive action. And the GT class remains a tight battle. Porsche, Porsche, Pontiac. The 07, Paul Edwards on board. Like I say, for the lead car in GT, Dirk Werner, did they get that oil leak or whatever it was fixed? I mean, all they did was look to me like there's pour water over the top of it. We'll have to look for that. Some other drivers to highlight on this field. Sam Hornish Jr. for Mike Shank Racing is back in 13th position as we ride with Pruitt. Randy Popes in that Mazda RX-8 is 16, the defending champion, York Bergmeister, 17. Max Pappas for Crone Racing in the 75 is back in 19th overall. AJ Armendinger is 21st. Boris said in the second Crone car is 24th overall. Boy, it's been a tough weekend for Crone. Winning the championship last year with Bergmeister, the 07 season has not started the way they would have hoped. That's Pappas tucked in behind his old teammate, Scott Pruitt. These two guys won the 04 championship. And it's great to have Max back in a Daytona prototype full-time in season 2007. 14 rounds this year. This is the 85 back in. Werner's in trouble right on cue doors. Mike? Yeah, the Grand Am official looked at the back. He just kind of gave the slash across the throat saying, you got to park this car. I'm underneath the car right now. It looks like the exhaust system is actually kind of falling apart. And it's just that you can just see smoke coming out of the tire wells from the top of the motor. This could definitely say this is going to be a long stop no matter what, because the Grand Am official is not going to let them back out until he is absolutely satisfied that they have fixed the problem. So the motor shut off. And now they're all looking in there, trying to see where the, all the smoke is coming from. The lead in GT will go to Jean-Francois Dumoulin. He's won here before. He's been a Coney Cup, Coney Challenge champion before. And now he will inherit the lead of GT at the Rolex 24. That will elevate the new Pontiac GXPR into second position. And Johannes van Overbeck, in a lap's time, will be elevated to third in the Jim Lowe TRG Porsche. There's Jean-Francois. I didn't think that the 85 had been fixed. It looks like they put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound is what they did. I mean, it's pouring water across the top of a oily mess doesn't fix it. Sweeping through into one, and Jean-Francois Dumoulin is the new leader of the GT class. The Allegra Motorsport, Fiorano Racing, Fiorano's been around a long time. Previously teamed with Don Caster Racing. Now aligned with Allegra. And Jean-Francois takes over the class lead. If you've just tuned in, welcome everyone. Speeds live and continual coverage. Lee Diffie and Dorsey Schrader with you here. Oh, and this is Scott Pruitt behind one of the Stevenson Corvettes. Was a little undecided on which way to go. Decided to go the high side. And this is the race leading car. Three cars in total on the lead lap with one and a half hours to go. Patrick Carpentier is second, Jan Magnussen is third, and it's all about those three cars. Who will have the speed? Who will have the clear run? Who has it to win the toughest race in sports cars? spoke with Mike Hull earlier in the weekend and Chris and I asked him, I said, what did you learn from winning last year with Dixon, Weldon and Mears? And he said, well, other than the regular stuff we know about 
the life of, of, of materials on the car, the engine, etc., aerodynamics, everything. The rhythm of the team, not necessarily the driver, is so important. If you have problems early in the weekend and you're scrambling just to make the start, it upsets the balance and flow and rhythm of the team. He said, that's what we're aiming for this weekend and that's what we've had. And for the 01 car, there has not been a blip. There has not been a hiccup. And despite the fact that Pruitt is teamed with two sports car rookie drivers in Montoya and Duran, it has gone faultlessly. And when you have a weekend like that, it's a great position to be in. And more amazingly than that, since this car didn't have any trouble, look back in third place, Jan Magnussen, the SunTrust, number 10 Pontiac Riley. It had all sorts of problems. It was down five laps. Now they battle for the lead. They're on the same lap, and they're not that far apart from one another. So that has been a huge effort to bring back those five laps for a competitive run toward this finish. The sister car was slammed into the tire barrier outside turn one. And was just an unfortunate incident for young Mexican driver Mimo Rojas, who we will see in the Rolex Sports Car Series this year, driving along alongside this man, Scott Pruitt. And he, Dixon and Weldon were doing so well, but that car was parked many laps ago. It's time to squeeze in a break. It's time for me to say farewell. It's been great being back. Great to be back in the States. Bob Barsha, David Hobbs and Dorsey will be with you right after the break. And the boys on pit road, Calvin and Brian, will be back to help out Chris Nell and Mike Johnson.